Hello, everybody. I am very excited to be here um, for our Mixed Faith Marriage Mastermind discussion with my colleagues, Brooke Booth and Chris Rich. And I'm leading this discuss discussion today. It's my turn. So I'm excited. Um, and we are going to talk about creating partnership in a mixed faith marriage today, which there's a lot of parts to that, to partnership, and especially when you're doing it in a mixed faith marriage. So let's just start with some introductions, even though, yeah, just let's just start with some introductions today. Whoever wants to start, maybe Brooke. Sure, I'll start. So I work with couples and individuals who are in a mixed faith marriage, and I like to think about it as helping them fall in love again after a faith transition, after a mixed faith marriage. I see that there can be like a fundamental shift in a relationship that can be really challenging after like the advent of a mixed faith marriage and like warmth and tenderness can be replaced with hurt and frustration. And I like to help individuals and couples like retap into that warmth and that tenderness and work through the frustration and the hurt. Okay. And I'm Chris Rich and my faith and my family are my top two priorities. I am an active believing member and I'm currently serving in my stake relief society presidency here in Massachusetts. I have been in a mixed faith marriage for about two decades now. And my husband, and I have three awesome kids. We've got a 14 year old son, a 19 year old son, and a 21 year old daughter. And um, all my kids and my husband have no interest in religion anymore. And I'm a certified life coach and I'm the host of the mixed faith relationship podcast. And I help members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who are looking to make their mixed faith relationships, not only just work, but to thrive. So that's me. And I'm Suzette Halterman and I work with couples a lot around learning how to negotiate and compromise and be sensitive to each other, all these partnership skills. Um, and I've been married for 18 years. So creating partnership in my own relationship has been an ongoing journey. And I'm sure we'll, we will talk about all of our journeys today. Um, yeah. So, and I, I love working with mixed faith couples or couples that have differences. Uh, and I've got four kids ages eight to four. 14, almost 15. So that's us. The reason we call this a mixed faith marriage mastermind is because we truly are bringing um, all of our hours of working with this in this topic professionally and personally and our different training and our different expertise here so that we can help people. We want to provide information to help um, other people navigate this complex uh, life of a mixed faith relationship. So that being said, I wanted to kind of introduce our topic before we start deep into our discussion. So we're talking about how to create a partnership in a mixed faith marriage. So I wanted to kind of read some definitions of partnership to kind of get it started here. Let me find my notes. Um, so here are some def definitions. Partnership uh, is an arrangement that's voluntary, mutually beneficial, and entered into for the purpose of mutually agreed upon objectives. And another definition is arrangements where parties agree to cooperate and advance their mutual interests. Um, a formal agreement made by two or more parties to jointly manage and operate a company, or in this case, a life, a marriage. Um, and I looked up kind of synonyms for partnership. And uh, so some of the words that came up were collaboration, association, affiliation, interaction, solidarity, exchange, reciprocity, interconnection, uh, mutualism, fellowship. And I just thought that was interesting because those to me are all like, those are verbs uh, that all came up like, well, very action oriented words like collaborate. Those are not passive words, collaboration, reciprocity, mutuality. You know, those are, um, those are all very like action oriented words that uh, not they're not passive at all and I think that's a good representation of what partnership is and what we're going to talk about today is the action part of it um this is not just a passive thing that happens this is a very action oriented thing we're creating um so that being said uh any thoughts that come to mind just 
from either of you after kind of hearing those definitions or thinking about synonyms that jump out to you to kind of get us started? I totally do. So I'm going to jump right in. So you're saying that, and I'm thinking, so I was a um, litigator for years before I became this life coach that I am now. And I worked in complex commercial litigation. So like partnership agreements, LLC membership agreements, shareholder corporation agreements. Like I was all up in the business on these types of agreements. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking like, if people were to come to me and they were to want us to start a partnership in business, I would be like, you have to have a very detailed, very clear, very well-structured operating agreement so that you both know what you're doing here, what you're getting into, what's okay, what's not okay, how the power differential, how the decisions, how everything's going to be decided. And like very clear operating agreements like solve so many problems. And I'm thinking, I mean, you're saying these things and you're saying these words and I'm like, we walk into these marriages, these partnerships with like zero clarity on like what I would call an operating agreement, like mm -hmm. zero. And, and then we have to sort of like cobble it together over time after problems arise and things like this. And I just, I see so many parallels in like the partnership that I saw in business and the partnership I see in relationships. And whenever we walk into these things naive, thinking it's just going to be fine and we don't need to talk about things or address things, we are wrong. <laughs> Not okay. And I think it's, I think it's interesting because I think that's why mixed faith relationships can be so tricky because as you're saying all those things, I'm like, that's what I had. Mm. And I know, I think many of the clients that I work with, I think we, because, you know, in a lot of situations, we, the, both partners grew up as members of the church and they have this idea that this is the agreement. We're going to, it's going to look like this, this, and this, and we're going to have all these milestones and we're going to do these things and we're not going to do these things. And I think it's, we have this idea that it's supposed to, to look this certain way. And then when it doesn't, that's when it's, I think that's when it's very tricky and to not to assume that just because you are, you both grew up in this faith. I think that's where it was really a problem for me. Cause it was just like, well, yeah, we just do these things. And it's important to have those conversations about what does that really mean? What does that look like? Yeah, I think I agree. And along the lines of an operating agreement, I think we step into, if you get married and with, within a religious context, you step into an operating agreement. Like you were saying, Brooke, like this is the way things are going to go. This is how we're going to do things, but we don't actually know how to create a partnership on our own. So that operating agreement changes. And then it's like, ah, like, I don't know how to create a partnership. I don't know what that looks like. And so uh, that's, I think that's why it becomes really problematic. So speaking of that, I wanted to ask you both to maybe just share um, a little bit about your own partnership journey, kind of that shift for you of when the operating agreement changed or, and that shuffle kind of just a brief, we'll, we'll kind of get into more detail, but just a brief kind of synopsis of your partnership journey, uh, the good and the bad. Whoever wants to start. I'll go, go ahead, for it. Go ahead, um, so I was thinking about when I was looking over our notes for this, my first thought was, um, what has my journey been like? It's been bumpy, <laughs> bumpy, messy, imperfect. And I think we have, I think we have this idea that, that things should always be going well, they should be going smooth and that we should always be partners. And I'm just going to be the first to say that is, has not been my journey that it's been, there have been times where we, I definitely felt like we were in this partnership. And then the other part of the time, I didn't feel like that. And I think that is so normal to have times where we do it's this 50 50 concept that we've talked about before that part of the time we are going to be on the working together smoothly. And the other part of the time we're not. And the part of that is okay. It's okay that it's not always perfect. Um, and I think for me, it was really hard because I thought we were partners when we were both on the same page with what I thought, I thought we were on the same page, but we weren't. And, um, 
then I think it's, um, yeah, just like there have been times where we were partners and times where we're not, and we definitely don't have it all figured out now. It's just that, that give and take that 50, 50 of, of in our relationships. So I'll add to that is my experience has been very bumpy too. Like I'll use Chris's <laughs> words. Like this area of developing my own partnership skills has probably been like the steepest learning curve for me personally. Um, tons of work I've had to do on partnership. I'm the product of my socialization. I'm the product of, you know, the family I came from and the culture I came from. And I was not taught nor modeled partnership. Like I'll be pretty blunt about that. Like that is not what I saw growing up. Now I saw beautiful relationships. I'm not saying what I saw was all terrible, but partnership was not something I was modeled. And it has been a really challenging journey for me to like assume this identity and develop these skills what's been one of the most important things for me to learn is to start to recognize like what's stopping me from being a partner. And I've had to really like recognize like owning my preferences, sharing my preferences. These are things I talk a lot about advocating for my preferences. These are skills that partners have that I did not have well-developed in me for many years of my marriage. And when I started to develop those skills, it brought up all sorts of stuff, all sorts of fears about being selfish, about being high maintenance, about being too much, about being unattractive, about being uh, just so much stuff, just constantly. Like, <laughs> and ironically, like not sharing my preferences and not like putting that on the table, like real partners created a lot of resentment and frustration and hurt. Like, like the situation was not good, just leaving it as the status quo either. I really had to learn to give myself permission to be a partner, doing all the things a partner does, showing up as a partner, which are like not often in alignment with how women are socialized. It certainly wasn't in alignment with how I was socialized. So my work around developing my own partnership skills has really been uncomfortable and an identity shift. And like, and a time where I really had to question my own socialization and decide like, what stays and what goes, because this is having a real impact in my marriage. Absolutely. I love the vulnerability of just saying like, this has been bumpy and hard and a lot of personal work. And I agree with that completely. I'd say my partnership journey over the past 18 years has been also very bumpy, very rough in a lot of ways in the sense that my version of partnership that I grew up with was being um accommodating and people pleasing and so I was a great I thought it was a great partner because I'm like I'm just gonna go with the flow and my needs kind of come last like I'm this great workable partner only to realize that wasn't really partnership so my growth has been all around like learning to rock the boat learning to like you know insert more of my needs and my wants and say like um I, maybe I'm not going to be so accommodating now. So that's always rocky, right? When you upset kind of the balance and then it, 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 it's hard to then, okay, well, how are we going to work with this? So yeah, I think, I think partnership is never easy. And I would imagine Brooke in the legal world, business world, uh, it's not easy in that sense either, which is why people have to have these very operating agreements and, you know, legal agreements that really hold people to their best behavior. Um, because I think our human nature is not really geared towards, well, I know our human nature is not really geared towards partnership. Um, so it takes a lot of work to, to create it. Um, so that being said, um, what have you seen both professionally and personally about how a mixed faith marriage, a shift in someone's faith, uh, really impacts a partnership. And we've talked some about this, but if you want to add anything else. Yeah, I'll add to it. I see that it, and I'm, I'm using the word force, but I think probably a better word is it invites. It invites us to, okay, I'll say it this way. A lot of times partnership isn't there for socialization for all sorts of reason. And, and a mixed faith marriage can really have somebody look at their relationship differently than they ever have before. And it can invite the opportunity to start developing those skills, can invite the opportunity to 
um, to look at the dynamics of a relationship and to question, do I want more partnership? So like, for instance, my own relationship, like we had to figure out how to be partners as parents with very different opinions, like different opinions on like Wednesday nights and baptisms and sacrament meeting attendance and all of these other things. And it invited us to learn partnership skills that frankly, before we didn't really have to develop. Like we just sort of could skate along in our mutual agreements. And when we came at it with different opinions, which happens in other parts of the marriage, it was just more prevalent now. It, it really invited us to develop these skills and to notice the gaps that we had in these skills. And I see that personally, and I see that definitely with clients. Like it's not that we're doing something wrong before. It, it's just an, it just opens up an opportunity to develop the skills that for whatever reason didn't need to be developed before. And I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier when we, when my husband and I were, I thought we were on the same page when we first got married. And um, when that safety net of, of the church is pulled away, then well, like what Brooke, like what you were saying there is then we need to have these conversations because we had never talked about certain things. We had never talked about what Sundays should look like and what they shouldn't look like. So definitely it, in, I like that, that it's an invitation to grow and to learn. Um, and I think one of the biggest things in my own life and with my clients is this idea that we should be on the same page, that we equate being partners as being on the same page. And that's not necessarily, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be like that, that, and it, it, as we're in this, you know, being in this mixed faith space, it's important to understand that I can still be a good partner and work as a partner and have a totally different opinion than my husband or my kids that, um, just get it. I had to let go of that idea that we needed, it needed to look this way. And that way was my way. <laughs> and that, you know, that, that was not helpful at all when we're trying to create this partner dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, any, any shift uh, is, is just going to alter the balance and these things that you've never had to talk about, you have to talk about. And it's, hard, especially if you come from a conflict avoidant family where you don't know how to talk about things or a high conflict family where the only way you know how to talk about things is like with defensiveness and criticism. So like learning how to do conflict, I think is a huge part of, of partnership. Um, and so this kind of brings to light, you know, I think a lot of people think um, our partnership was easier or we were able to do partnership better when we were in the same faith. And that's why it's hard to have a mixed faith marriage is because we can't do partnership. So I, I read one definition of partnership that I really liked. It said that partnership is about sharing responsibility, sharing power and sharing a vision. And I think a mixed faith, when somebody shifts their faith, it shatters the sharing a vision part, but it also kind of shatters the sharing um, power part, like power and decision-making, sharing that where it's not, uh, whereas before you didn't really have to share that power because you're on the same page, but like power sharing decision-making about kids, um, it's, it's kind of affected and the responsibilities too. Like maybe like in my relationship, I was the one who was teaching spirituality and religion in the home because my husband's schedule is super erratic. So when, when my faith shifted, it also changed the responsibility. Like, I don't want to be responsible for that anymore. It's not my belief system. Uh, if you want to have responsibility for that, now that's on you, right? Like it shifted all those things. So just want to know your thoughts about that, sharing power, sharing responsibility and sharing, um, what was the third thing? Oh, vision. Um, and kind of how to deal with that when somebody shifts their faith or any thoughts on that. Okay. I have many thoughts on this. <laughs> it's a really big breath. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening to you talk about like sharing power and sharing responsibility and sharing a vision. And I'm thinking, I don't want to sound like I'm arguing because I think what you're seeing here is really important, but I want to add a slightly different perspective. 
is that that sounds more like roles as far as like who's the spiritual director of the home, who's inviting people to family home evening, family prayer to like these things. I see that as like a role we fulfill, which I think is maybe different than power or responsibility. And, and because I think power and responsibility, like when I look at my own relationship, like I was also the spiritual director. I was like, okay, it's time for, you know, and I was, you know, preparing all the lessons and coming up with all of that stuff. Um, when I shifted out of that, you're right. There was like a gap in the role that was being fulfilled. Like you're right. Somebody wasn't taking that responsibility, but as far as power, like, I, I'm like, I think that's a little bit different because having like a shared belief system in no way create shared power or shared responsibility or even a shared vision. Like, exactly. And I see that in my own relationship. Like we totally had the same belief system in many regards. We weren't sharing power or sharing responsibility or even sharing a vision in some aspects of our life. Like they didn't correlate in a really strong way. And, and so I think separating out like, okay, if there's a role that somebody was doing and now it's not being done. It's kind of like there's a vacancy there and I get that, but that doesn't always correlate to like shared power. And so when I think, I think what happens is sometimes when you like strip this away or like roles get, you know, vacant, um, it can be really fascinating to see what's going on in the relationship, like really in terms of power and vision and responsibility when that sort of I loved how you said, like, we sort of get handed an operating agreement, like we enter into like, like the temple marriage and all this, like, okay, this is how you guys are going to do it. When we strip that away, like, it can be really fascinating to see, like, what, what, what are we operating from? Like, what, how is power figured out between us and responsibility and vision? Like, this was, again, something my husband and I were like, this was tough work for us because we were just like, well, we just do it this way. And then that was pulled away. And we found we had very different opinions about how this should be done when we were trying to craft our own like operating agreement instead of just the default one we were handed. Th those are my thoughts. Chris, what do you think? I'm really curious to hear your. Opinion. Well, I, I think too, that sometimes we have the same belief system, but we're not um, we're not sharing power or responsibility that I think it's easy to be like, well, if we were on the same page, then this would be easier and we would be doing these things, but it's, you might have the same, I, I think we can see examples where you have two people of the same faith where they do share that and they do have a partnership, but you can also see people that are, that don't have that partnership, even with those same things. And you know, all the different combinations of that. So I think it's, it's easy to be like, yeah, if we were on the same page, then this would happen. But it, just because you share beliefs doesn't mean that that is partnership and um, sharing that responsibility. Yeah, I love your the idea of stripping it away. Fine. If you strip away your definitions, like, well, what is how are we going to share, share power? What does that look like? What is even power? <laughs> what does that mean? Like, what is our vision? Like, let's, let's take a step back. And where can we agree that we have this vision? Like, what is our, it's, it's creating a new set of agreements. So yeah, I love all those things. I um, think, oh, go ahead. one thing that I was going to add to that is in maybe I like to look at it, like, what do we value? Cause it's easy, you know, for me, it's like, I have the things that, that, that I are important to me from the church and my husband doesn't have those, but we do share a lot of common values. We both, hard work is very important to both of us. Honesty, having fun together, recreation, kindness, all those things, we may just kind of look at it in a different lens, but we, those are, so I think identifying what are our common values, I think that can be really helpful in a situation like this. We're similar, recreation, fun, just enjoying each other is is part of our newer vision so that's I agree with that um okay so let's talk about then what are some of like the skills um like what is how do we take an active role in being a partner you know we're talking about all these things but I would love to just hear some words or skills or what comes to your mind about what is it that we actually have to do in order to do these things like talk about 
how we're going to share power and create a new vision and how we're going to, um, you know, change our operating agreements. Like what are the skills that are required to actually be in partnership? How do we take an active role in creating it? It's a big question, but I just want to see what, hear what comes up. I got some ideas. (laughs) Um, I think we have this, we have this idea that our partner is supposed to meet all of our needs and they're supposed to make us happy. And I think one of the, I think that's one of the gifts that I've learned from coaching is that it's my job to figure out what my needs are, which I think a lot of us have no idea. So I need to figure out what my needs are. And it's, it's my job to make sure those needs are met. I like to think of myself as the general contractor to my needs. First, I have to identify what they are. And then there are some of my, you know, different needs. So we have like physical, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, you have all these different needs that we have. And so identifying what those are for me. And, and then there are some things that, that my husband is really good at. And he's the person that is the perfect person to fulfill that need. But there are some things like he has no interest in spirituality and, or, you know, religion. And so I don't want to, I don't want to put that need on him. That's not his responsibility. That's my responsibility. So if I'm the general contractor of my needs, making sure they all get met, I might, there are a lot of, I can fulfill a lot of my own spiritual needs, or I can go talk to a friend from church or my ministering sister or, you know, another family member, but making sure that I take care of those needs and not, I don't want to place all of my needs on him because there's some things that he's just not the person to do that. And I think when I figured that out, that helped me. And in a way it feels like you're not being partners because you're taking care of your own needs. But when I started to really understand that it's my job to take care of my needs and to create my happiness, then when, if I do that part and he does that, then we just come together and can love each other. And I think that can be so helpful in a partnership when we're not, um, relying on the other person to meet all of our needs, if that makes sense. I, just, I think of a business partnership, like part of agreements of partnerships is who's responsible for what, right? So we have to, we have to delegate that in our own relation, in our own marriages. Like I'm responsible for my own well being, and I need to communicate that and you're responsible for yours. And then, you know, I think that I agree with that. Is that so, num- I'm sorry if that phone is coming from me. I think in my, okay, I don't know. Okay. Hear it. You're good. Good. Okay. I have some thoughts on this too. Um, one, I would say when you're trying to take an active role in creating a partnership, there's going to be a different starting point for everybody. Like this is like, this is a very like individual type of a, like where to even start. So it's going to be really different for different people and depending on the different dynamic in your relationship and your own, where you are in your own internal work. So I'll just give an example from my own experience. So if you're like me, I kept showing up as really deferential and like Suzette was giving examples of this. I'll just go along, put me last, like really deferential, thinking that I was selfish for for bringing up things that mattered to me, not willing to pursue things if my spouse showed discomfort or frustration. Like that's my pattern. So that's the work I need to do. Like that's where I need to start really working on my own partnership skill set. So for example, in me, I saw the pattern where I bring something something up for discussion. My husband would express some sort of concern and then I just drop it like a hot potato. Now, again, I think back to like, if this was a business negotiation, like I've sat in so many business mediations. Like if somebody offers me like, like an offer or some in the negotiation, I'm not like, well, that's not going to work. Drop this like a hot potato going home. I'd be like, okay, we're just getting started. Like, let's, let's see what else we can do here. But like in my own relationship, as soon as like the first like sign of hesitation, I'm like backing off, Never mind. This isn't important. Like, that's where I needed to do my work around partnership. And again, it's going to be really different for every people. But like learning how to have my own back, 
like when I felt something was important, not stopping the discussion just because discomfort was expressed, like really letting things be fully explored. So much of the work I need to do with clients, I see it might be a different like flavor. They may need to be developing a different area where they're struggling showing up as a partner or receiving partnership. And again, it's so, it's like so detailed and not detailed, that's not the right word, individual. But I, I love just starting to ask yourself, like, where am I, like, where where's the skills I need to develop to be a partner? Where am I stopping from my, like, from showing up as a partner? Like, what's going on there? Like, why am I doing that? Where am I, like, preventing myself from becoming a partner? Those are really good questions to start to understand, like, where do I even start developing my own partnership abilities? I completely agree. It is so individual. I think there's there's kind of a spectrum and some people are more on the passive side and they need to kind of insert more of their wishes and desires. And some people are on more the, the dominant side and their work is to like not be trying to control, right? This is about control. I got to control everything or I got to, you know, I'm too rigid. It's both people really working on their flexibility. I think flexibility is a big skill. Being able to give and take, like, I don't think partnership is about like everything is equally divided. It's like, well, this isn't as important to me, but it's important to you. So I can give here, or this is important to me. So I'm going to like voice that and we got to negotiate that. So yeah, negotiation and compromise and give and take and being more assertive, being less assertive. Those are all really important skills that I totally agree, Brooke, is just so dependent on you and uh, where your personal edge is and where your work is. Um. So that brings us to like, what prevents this partnership? What prevents people from doing this and making those shifts and changes? What gets in the way of partnership and us doing those things to kind of create it? Any thoughts on that? The blocks. Lots of thought. Oh, go ahead, Brooke. I'll just build off of like, so like the thoughts I have that create my own lack of partnership, I'm being selfish should just be okay with the how things are. I should be grateful. It's not a big deal. I should just get over it. So that's the person who tends to be like more passive. Like the person on the other side who probably maybe is like steamrolling a little bit, like this is the right way. This is how we should be doing things. Like, of course, this is like how it should be done. Like, start to identify what those are. And they're going to sound like true. They're going to sound like the truth of reality. And, but that's the ones we start to need to question, pick apart, deconstruct, because that's the very thing stopping us from being able to develop into a partnership. Well, and I think, so I'll just, I was definitely that this is the right way. This is what we, it should look like this. All those things. I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, definitely looking at those. And for me, it was really important to like, look at what, what is my end goal? If I am choosing to stay in this relationship, and I think that's an important thing to recognize that we do have a choice if we want to stay or to go in a relationship. But for me, I decided I do want to stay. I am choosing to do this. And if I am going to stay, I want to have this partnership. I want to have this connection. and. If I, so often we put ourselves in this one up, one down mentality where I'm right, you're wrong. And we're not going to see eye to eye if we're not, if we're thinking our way is the right way. Um, I think also keeping score, that's a terrible thing that I'm totally guilty of that. um, And forgetting that we're on the same team, that we're both trying to create this partnership or this relationship And I think one thing to note too, is you might be in a situation where you want a partnership, but your partner, we, we cannot control what our partner does. And that even if the things that we're bringing to the table, if we're trying to be a good partner, and I think that can, that goes a long way, just trying to be the kind of partner that we, that we want. Am I the kind of partner that I would want to have? even if our partner isn't on the same page. Yeah, I, I love all of those. I would, yeah, I would add to that 
just rigidity. There's a, a couple's therapist who she has, a, I don't remember the quote exactly, but she said, it's not differences that will kill a relationship. It's rigidity. It's when somebody's not able to like be flexible within the partnership. It doesn't mean you have to change your views or your beliefs, but there has to be some flexibility to move a little bit, to negotiate. It's not my way or the highway kind of thing. So yeah, I think rigidity, contempt, um, those are really big blockages and not having an agreement that a partnership is what we're going to create. Like, I think that should be the first thing in your operating agreement. What kind of marriage do we want? Do we want a partnership or do we want something that's not a partnership, which makes me think like, if it's not a partnership, what is it? And what comes to my mind is like, then it's a competition. It's a competitor, right? If you're not working together, you're working against each other. Do we want a competitive relationship? Do we want a partnership? Do we want like a sole proprietorship with employees, you know, like I'm the boss and you do what I say, like what, what kind of marriage are we creating? And I think both people need to be in agreement about that and talk about that. Like what is our basic standard of marriage? Is it partnership or is it something else? So I don't know what comes to your mind. If it's not a partnership, what else might it be? You know, when I see a lot personally and professionally, like I'll own all of this is I call it like the lobbyist and the Senator. So the lobbyist is like, hey, here's some suggestions. Here's some, you know, let me show you the statistics and the strategies. And maybe I'll even draft some bills and draft some things. And But then the senator gets to actually make the decision. So this is like where you can see the power differential. See lots of relationships functioning as like, call it the lobbyist and the senator. I did this for a long time. I'm a very good lobbyist. You should see my power presentations. They're amazing. But like not having the power, like that shared power, not, not a partnership. The other one I see too is what I call role-based relationships where you're both like just really good at doing your roles. And, and again, that's probably part of like that original operating agreement. Like it's like, you do this and you do this and you can be really good at doing those roles, but that does not mean you are having a partnership. Like that can be a very different type of relationship. Now, I'm going to say this too, just because you don't have a partnership doesn't mean like having a partnership is a great way to have a relationship but it's not the only like it's not like the ideal even it's just one of many and like this is a choice and you get to decide which one works for you and there are lots of I've seen lots of role-based relationships and they're very happy they're very content they're very much in love me personally I do prefer a partnership but I just want to be really cautious like that doesn't mean like this is like, because it's right for me means it's right for you or right for your neighbor, or right for your parents or whoever. I think another thing, um, we also we also have this victim villain mentality that you did this to me where we're blaming. And when we're a victim, every victim needs a villain. And I totally saw this in my own relationship. I see this in as I'm working with my clients, it's easy to fall into that mentality. And if you think about it, do you really want to be partners with a villain? Probably not. So we have to really check ourselves that if I'm viewing, if I'm feeling like a victim, is that how I want to feel? And do I really want to see my partner as a, as a villain? Cause I'm going to just spoiler alert. It's not going to go well. I, that can be a really hard thing. Um, also, the other thing, if we're not, you asked the question, if we're not partners, what are we? I think a lot of times we end up as roommates where, I don't know if you guys can relate to that, but there's just times where it's like, yep. And I think what Brooke was talking about with the with our roles, it's like, yep, I did my stuff. You do your stuff. And we end up being roommates instead of connecting and and creating meaningful relationships that we can find peace and joy in. I love that. Such good. There's such depth. We could take like an hour for each of these questions, I think, but, um, but I love what you're saying. So I think another big topic that we could spend a whole hour on, but we'll just briefly address partnership in parenting. Like how can you be, I think this is where a lot of mixed faith couples get stuck. Like they can maybe be decent partners despite their faith differences like they're working that out but parenting it's like but this is the place where we're supposed to be on the same page how on earth can we be partners around parenting um so this is that's a really we could talk a lot about that but maybe just give 
just your thoughts, maybe kind of your best advice or thoughts about how to have a partnership um, as, as parents, even if you don't have the same belief system. I think one of the most important things to remember is that we both love our kids. And that is something that we, that we agree on, that we both love, that we want the best for them. And to, you know, like when I'm coming from my point of view, which is just, I, I just see what's in front of me. I want it to look a certain way, but remembering like, just because he does it differently, it doesn't mean that he's wrong or, you know, it's not a right or a wrong thing. We just have a different way of doing it. And we both ultimately at the end of the day, want what's best for our kids. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Something that's helped me a lot in this particular area is giving us both permission to parent the way we, like that's an integrity with our own belief system. Like he gets to parent how he wants to parent and I get to parent how I want to parent. Now this idea makes some people uncomfortable for what you were saying, Suzette. They're like, well, then won't this confuse the kids? We won't be on the same page, all of this. And I hear that and I get it. But there is like, there's when you don't allow your spouse to parent the way they want, you know, you're shutting them down or they're shutting you down. And that's problematic in, in my opinion. And when you give them both permission to like show up the way you want as a parent, I get to show up the way you get to show up the way. And this means now we have to trust our kids to make their own decisions. Like they get to have their own information, ideas from you, ideas from your spouse, and they get to make their own inform. Like they get to make their own decision. Not easy for a lot of parents, but it works for me. This is in alignment with my own parenting values. And I'm not going to like say this is easy, but I think that's more important than being on the same page. This idea of like giving people permission to live according to their own integrity and then letting the kids make their own decisions because they are anyway. Yeah, I, I agree with both of those. I think what's been most helpful for our parenting partnership is to really zoom out and find where we do agree. Like you were saying, Chris, like we both love our kids. Like for us, it's, we want our kids to be able to make choices that will allow them to lead happy, fulfilling lives. So when we kind of zoom way back out to that, like we both agree on that. Well, our differences actually strengthen that, right? So religion can be a part of that. Having a higher power can be a part of their learning to make choices, but so can all these other things um, and their social emotional skills. And like we each bring our um, our strengths and our differences in service of that. And it helps us not be against each other, but it's like, oh yeah, you know, like, you know, my husband more loves the, the structure and the, um, the social community of religion. Like, yeah, that's great in service of helping them if they choose those things to have you know, good things in their lives. And the things that I bring are different, but it's also in service of that goal. So kind of zooming out and finding where are, what are our shared goals for our kids and how can our totally different perspectives both be in service of that? So they're not competing, they're in service. Um, so that's and my I think, thought. I think pointing that out too, like dad and I both have the same goal. We both mm -hmm. think that service is important. And I my belief is this, and this is what dad believes. So showing, you know, like, and it's okay to, yeah, this is how I see it. This is how he sees it, but we're both headed towards that same value. Yeah. I love that. I think value-based parenting is really helpful uh, for partnership, like finding the common values. Uh, you can have different beliefs within those value systems for sure. Um, all right. So we're, we need to wind down. So just a few more questions here um maybe just about like what i think we've kind of already talked about this but your own edge your own skills you're working on like what are the things you are doing in your personal life to be a better partner to create a partnership um because like we talked about this is a daily this is a daily thing and it's a bumpy ride that's normal it's an active process that we have to work on day to day minute to minute 
um, for me anyway, it's a minute to minute choice I have to make. It's like, okay, I'm, how do I be a partner in this situation? Um, so just what comes to mind, what are you, what are you working on personally to be a better partner, to create partnership in your marriage? I'm not a fan of conflict. In fact, I will run the other way. <laughs> and I think it's actually been really healthy for me to, to not, to not be so conflict avoidant. Cause when a lot of times we don't want to say something or we don't want to do something. So we don't, and then we are, we have our own internal conflict. So I can av avoid the external conflict, but I'm still conflicted. So I think it's, in, that's something that I'm working on is um, sharing those, sharing my opinions when it might be uncomfortable, when my husband or my kids might not like what I say um, in a loving, respectful way, but making, you know, speaking up, saying what's important to me and letting there be conflict. And it, it's amazing. The more that I do that, it, it's like more opportunity to be vulnerable and it might be uncomfortable for a little bit, but it seems like then we come together more and it's like, oh, okay. And, you know, he'll, he'll share more of what's going on for him and having, sharing these, I think when we allow conflict, we don't need to be contentious. We don't need to be jerks about it, but when we can allow that conflict, then we come together more in more of a partnership. So that's something I'm personally working on. I like how you're saying like my personal edge, cause I definitely have one and it's like, oh, are you frozen to that? No, I'm, I'm good now. You're frozen for a minute, but I think we're good. Um, my personal edge is like learning to be okay with me, like me in the partnership, like instead of trying to just fit in, but really letting myself belong in the partnership and being okay, showing up as who I am. This takes a lot of courage. This is tying back to like showing up with my voice and who I am and my preferences, like really just being okay with me and who I am. Um, and I'm like, I want to speak to some women out there. Like I'm already kind of like a strong person. Like I already, like, I know I have like these deferential tendencies, but I'm also kind of like a loud mouth in many instances. <laughs> and my husband, when he, when I talk about like that, I'm deferential, he sometimes looks at me like, I can't even imagine what you would be like if you were to strip that away. <laughs> Cause I, I, I am a bigger personality than some people. But it's still something I really notice in myself is, and I know if like, I'm deferential and it's something I really struggle with. I suspect other women have this even more so. And really just learning to be okay with who we are and that we don't have to justify our preferences, our wants, our dreams, our desires with like, we don't have to justify them to our spouse. We don't have to make our spouse comfortable with them. We don't have to like put frilly edges around them to make them more acceptable and okay but like just who we are is enough to me this is the edge I'm working on to help me be a partner so I'm not showing up deluding myself or pretending to be somebody I'm not so that's that's not like how can you partner with a pretend version I love all of that um I would say for I'm I'm working on very similar things as both of you I think for me Oh, <laughs> it's, it's always hard work. I think that's the part that I'm working on daily is to realize that partnership does not mean that there is not conflict and ups and downs and disharmony and disconnection. Like partnership, I think is more by nature, a roller coaster. It involves negotiation and Hey, that doesn't work for me, but what can we work out? And, Oh, this isn't working for you. How can I be more like aware of how I impact you? And it's, it's such a dynamic process. So I think that is my growing edge is to be okay with the dynamic process of it all and realize that is partnership uh, mm -hmm. because it means we're both like talking and working and letting each other know when something's not working right and inserting our opinions. And that by nature is, you know, con conflictual. So being okay with that. Um, I think the other growing at the edge that I'm always having to work on is my own uh, wanting, just putting myself in e equality never feeling like, well, my reasoning is better than, or because I know a lot about relationships, like, yeah, but I don't know about 
you, right? What matters is you, not like just putting myself always as being equal. Um, I don't know better than, I don't know less than, I'm not more worthy or less worthy, like just viewing myself as total equal. Um, I think that's a really important part. And that's like a minute. I feel myself slipping up and down all the time from equality, like feeling myself, like looking down on him or feeling like, uh, like I, I'm, I shouldn't insert myself here, you know? So it's like, it's, it's such a balancing act and my growing edge is just being okay with that. And it looks different every day. <laughs> for me so that's something I, uh, any, I want to just like piggyback on what you said we haven't talked about equality so I'm really glad you brought it up because I think partnership and equality go hand in hand and and sometimes it's hard for us to really acknowledge and see the inequality inherent in our relationships and it can be from situation to situation like this lobby and senator thing like sometimes I'm the senator and my husband's the lobbyist and sometimes vice versa that's an inherently unequal relationship and when you have an unequal relationship you're not partners like it's like they can't coexist at the same time so I, i'm glad you've introduced that language yeah well i like that idea just that i mentioned earlier the one up one down dynamic sometimes it's me up here and i'm looking down and just recognizing like oh okay if i'm a partner i need to i need I need to come down and, and see this on eye level and the other other times it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to, to kind of close out, maybe just um, what thoughts do you have? Any closing thoughts that's just any burning words you want to leave around the idea of partnership um, before, before we end our discussion? I'll say this is sometimes your spouse isn't going to be interested in developing a partnership. They're perfectly fine with some other model of a relationship. And two things. One, that doesn't mean you can't still be a partner in your own right. You can still develop the skills and be that type of person. And that can be something really empowering and like integrous for you to develop. The other thing is like, sometimes when your partner doesn't want a partnership or they don't fully understand your version of partnership or whatever, they, that might be something to take some time to mourn and be sad about. And that's totally fine. Like to be like to really acknowledge that that's a sad thing that you're mourning, that that's not the current situation in your relationship. I think that can be a really healthy approach instead of resisting it and just getting pissed that you can't have something you want but just acknowledging like that's sad and I'm sad about that and working working through that on that sad level instead of on the piss level and and I'll add on to that 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 might be a non-negotiable for some people and a reason for ending the relationship and we don't talk about that as much but if you want two different kind of marriages where one person is like no like I will not be happy unless I'm in a relationship where we can create a partnership and the other person just doesn't care, like you want two different things. And so that, that's a truth that you have to really be honest about. Like we want really different kinds of marriages. That's hard to, to negotiate. You might be able to do that. And it might be that you have to say that's a non-negotiable for me. So and I think I would just add to that to make sure that I'm a good partner to myself, mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm speaking up, that I'm sharing my thoughts, my, if I need to say something that's hard to say, getting my own back. I think it's, um, when I show up, like I was talking about earlier, when I, when I've taken care of my own needs, I'm going to show up as a better partner and that I can't influence what he does, but I can influence what I do. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, I think in summary, partnership is work. It's hard. It's an active process day to day, hour to hour. Um, we could talk about it for days. I could anyway. I love this topic. So thank you, ladies. Um, so many good thoughts. So, so much wisdom to share. So thank you. Thank you. You guys are the best. Thank you.